Are we, are we about on time? I think so. I guess we're right on time. So hi everyone, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Henrik Blixt. I'm a product manager in the NFE BU at VMware. So I was going to talk to you a little bit about uh, what I've been hearing from, from the service providers we've been talking to, some of the, the customers that I meet with, uh, and a little bit on their, their feedback and what they've been seeing uh, in terms of using OpenStack, what they love about OpenStack, uh, maybe some of the challenges they're seeing, um, and I'll talk a little bit about what, what, what can be done to, to mitigate that. So just a standard disclaimer, I wasn't planning on presenting any roadmap, but sometimes I talk about shooters anyway. Uh, and being a product manager, anything I say will be used against me, so the only thing I can promise you is that any roadmap things I talk about will, will change, so uh, please don't hold it against me. So just quickly, some high-level challenges. The promise of OpenStack, I think most of, most of you in here know OpenStack pretty well. Uh, how many in here are from a service provider, work for a ser service provider or with a service provider? About half of you, maybe. Okay. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how uh, how I came back to, to loving OpenStack again. So, so what, what, what are some of the concerns that, you know, when, when I meet with these service providers, you guys, some of your colleagues, some of your, um, some, some of your, uh, the other companies are out there. Um, what, one is the leg, breaking free from legacy hardware. A lot of the, a lot of the hardware that's out there uh, is, is legacy, you know, purposeful, Purpose-built hardware for, for, for your net network services, and that's you know, that's one of the driving forces behind NFV as well, right? Getting getting off from all these purposeful built hardware, get, getting to something that's a little bit more agile, a little bit easier to manage, getting getting away from having something that's very uniquely built for, for a specific thing, which which makes it very inflexible. Because if something is built into the hardware to solve a certain thing making that hardware thing do something else is, is, is pretty hard. It also means that, that upgrading it is, is pretty hard. If, if you need to, if something is built in, if there's this switch or a certain functionality, a certain card built into that hardware and you need a new feature that needs a new card, you actually need to send someone to that machine and, and replace something, or replace the whole thing. Um, and once you start getting into distributed deployments and in mech architectures where you might have tens or hundreds or thousands of these boxes, you know, sending out thousand people to replace a card or, or a whole box is, is getting pretty tricky and, and expensive. Uh, and it's going to take time too. It's not just going out to all these places. It's actually, you know, all, all of you that, that have been suicide, I started my day days as a suicide, you know, being in the data center, pulling cables and, and doing all that takes, takes time, right? So, so trying to get away from that and doing something that can be done by fewer people, more automated and, and faster. And, and some of these, the, the hardware life cycles that for a lot of these boxes, since they're pretty expensive, they're hard to get out there, are, are also pretty long, right? So that means that the, the skills might, for, for maintaining this, this hardware thing, or the card that is, might be uh, you know, very, very legacy. So maintaining the people that know these skills might be hard, um, might be you know hard to get find people that know the skills for for a hardware box that that was only sold for a few years you know ten years ago. Something else that there, there are a lot of concerns around is, is innovating faster, not just innovating because innovating is is fairly easy, but innovating faster is is what the way we want to do and the, the networks they have based on you know, what we just talked about, the, the legacy hardware, they're not really prepared to, to innovate because of you know, the, the slowness of doing anything to, to the network. And they need to roll out features faster. And especially when they're getting into the, to NFV and, and virtualizing, they have their upcoming uh, competitors that, that have a, a newer, more modern architecture, architecture that can roll out features a lot faster because, you know, that they're, they're virtualized versus you know, rolling out new hardware. So they need to get into to that thinking of, of getting things out faster. And also innovate continuously. It's not a big bang innovation that, hey, we have a great idea, let's build a box for it, uh, roll it out, and then five years later, hey, we have a new great idea, let's roll out this, this new box. 
it, it needs to be continuous. Um, you, you can't have innovation cycles that are five, or even two years, even one year. You need to get new things out all the time. Uh, maybe not daily, but you know, as new ideas come up, they need to get out faster so you can get feedback. Because when you have that long innovation cycle, it's also going to get very costly because it takes years to build the box. Um, and then rolling it out takes a while. So it, it's going to take a while to get feedback. So I'm not really sure, is this really the thing that, that people want, the, the, the feature that my customers are asking for? So if you can do that innovation fast, you also get feedback fast, and you know that maybe I should roll this back, or maybe I should focus more on this. Uh, and, and, and that also helps them shorten the time to revenue. Because there's also a lot of risk when you innovate, innovate slowly, it's also going to take you time to, to get to the revenue. It, it might be a good revenue, but the risk of, of getting that large revenue is going to take you so long that we want to make sure that it, it's better to take a little bit less revenue by getting it faster, because it makes it easier you know, to do your planning and, and, and so on. Um, anyone that's attended any session here this week has probably heard a lot about Kubernetes, Cloud Native, containers, um, and as the telcos and service providers start looking at how they're virtualizing, they're also looking at containers. Um, and that they're realizing that it's more than just containerizing. And everyone that's, that's done anything with containers know that, or tried to put anything with containers into production, no, it's, it's more than just taking, hey, I have an application, I'm going to package it up in a container, and I'm done. Now, anyone that's tried to do this in production, know that it's, it's quite a lot more than that. And it's, it's a different way of thinking. Uh, it's a different tool set. So that there's, there's more than just the, the packaging that, that need to happen. And if you have a, a organization or that, that's more legacy focused and with, with the thinking, actually getting the processes changed um, might be much harder than, or is much harder than just, just the packaging. You might need new tools. In, instead of learning how to, to deploy a VM, you need to figure out how to plug something into you know, a CICD uh, tool chain or something like that, right? which, which is a different way of thinking, different way of working. You need to learn a new set of, of technologies. Um, and another issue that, for those of you that have attended more sessions or more than one summit or maybe a cube console like that, you also know that these technologies change a lot. Right? You know, three years ago, it was all about Docker. Then, a couple of years before that, it was Mesos. Now it's all Kubernetes. Um, so trying to keep up with that, figuring out what technologies to, to, to bet on, what to invest in, um, is, is another risk. And that they're moving very fast. And not only do you need to figure out what, what do I bet on and bet my money on, also what, you know, what people do I hire, what, what do I train these people for. So, it's, so that's you know, an area of concern, away, concern as well, because tel the telcos want to make sure that whenever they bet on something is going to be in the networks, it's going to be there for a while. So they want to make sure that it's something that they can actually support so they don't end up with the same, the same legacy situation they have today with the hardware, but just with software instead, because then you know, that would be almost, almost as bad. And building a, a software-based carry grade uh, environment. Um, these, a lot of these networks and network services are, are very mission critical. You know, if, if you try and, and use your phone and your phone is not working, you're going to get pretty upset. It might even you know, be life and death, death situation, right? So you can't have something that, you try and call 911 or, or 112, and you, you get an exception in your phone, or you can't you know, connect to the network. It's not going to be very popular. Um, how, many, how many in here has seen software or written software with bugs in it? Probably, probably most of you, right? <laughs> and, and, and that's just something we as software developers, we just accept the fact that if you write software, there's going to be bugs in it. If, if you deploy a, a VNF, a virtualized function that has bugs in it, and you can't call 911 and one, or 112, depending on where in the world you are, that's a little bit different, right? So, so when you do this hardware-based, it seemed like, you know, for, for some reason, no offense to, to all the software engineers in here, but it seems like hardware engineers are better at building stuff than software engineers, because it seems like there are fewer bugs in these, these old, older, purposeful-built um, switches or boxes they have than, than the software that 
that we build. So, 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 so that's one of the challenges. Like, how, how do we make sure that the, what, what we build doesn't have those bugs and, and you know, something that's as stable and, and mission critical with all, you know, four, five, six, nines as they have today in, in their hardware-based platforms. Um, as, as we build all these various software and we do microservices, we you know, build all various, various software parts, we also need to stitch them together. Uh, in some way, it was, it was almost easier in, in one way earlier when you know, pulled one cable out here and you plugged it in over here and you're like, hey, my integration is done. Um, whereas trying to figure out you know, the, the various payloads in, in terms of text files or whatever it is that needs to be sent between the various systems and, and how they interact with each other, making sure that the APIs are compatible, the you normal know, APIs aren't getting removed or changed. Um, it's, it's also a bit of a challenge. With, with the hardware, it was also pretty, figuring out you know, the resource allocation was pretty easy. Hey, here's a box, it has this many resources in it. That's how much resources you have. If you need more resources, you need to put another box in. Once you start deploying VNFs and you have multiple VNFs sharing a virtual environment, it gets a little bit harder. Because another thing, is, another thing you don't want to end up with is resource starvation. You might have you know, a couple of VNFs on the same infrastructure and you want to make sure that the, the, the one that handles those emergency calls doesn't get resource starvation. If it's something that, if someone is watching Netflix or something, right, and you're watching your favorite TV show, whatever, on, on, when you're on the subway, probably won't be too upset, you know, if it you know, pauses for a second or two. But if you can't reach one, one, two, then you're going to get a little bit more upset. Um, so you need to make sure that, you know, the critical software applications that you have deployed here actually has the, the resources they need and making sure we can carve those out in this virtualized environment. And not only that, we also need to make sure that the software crashes. No, no we, we need to make sure that it doesn't crash. Um, and for those of you that, had, that have seen a bug or two or written a bug or two, um, it's also the same, the same, somewhat similar to what you said before about the hardware. The hardware boxes don't, for some reason, don't seem to crash as often as, as our software. So we want to make sure that whatever we build has the resiliency in, in HA because eventually we are going to run into one of these bugs. And when we do, we want to make sure that you know, whatever was running is act will actually survive or, or come back up again. And for those of you that were here for the previous session, you heard Vanessa talk about uh, distributed clouds and, and MEC. Um, and that brings in another set of challenges as well, because the, these boxes that were placed, they were pretty you know, autonomous. They were sitting there doing their stuff. But they were, they were also not very distributed. You might have had you know, a couple of data centers in the US, or a handful at the most, or spread across the world. When you start looking at distributed architecture in, in, in MEC, and you might have you know, hundreds or thousands of deployments, then you, know, you, you can't have a sysadmin logging on to every box to do a you know, dot slash update. Um, so you need to make sure, you know, how, how do we automate this, and how do we, how do we handle these new environments uh, at scale? So the, all, the, all this had, you know, the service provider scratching their heads. How do you figure this out? How do you do this? What are the best tools to, to do this? And there's been a lot of excitement around OpenStack, and for those of you that have been in the community for a while, um, you've seen that, you know, telcos and service providers have, you know, started coming out in, in larger and larger numbers uh, and looking at OpenStack. So what, what, what is so cool about OpenStack, and what, what do they love about OpenStack? Uh, one of the big things is, is you know, the community, all of us working together. When, when we had more specialized hardware, you know, there's, you had five vendors, we're all building their own little box, right? There was no, this vendor was sitting in here building their box, the next vendor was sitting over here building their box. Here we are, you know, thousands of people all working together building the infrastructure for, for all, those, all those things, right? So they, uh, Service providers usually are, are very nervous about sticking to one vendor, so you know they have maybe multiple vendors. Um, and, and here, with, with in, in the open source community, in the open stack community, we have all vendors when vendors collaborating. So instead of like having the vendor sitting in you know 
their own labs, their own rooms, building these these hardware boxes. We have you know all the all the software vendors here working together, trying to figure out how to build the best platform that that they and, and you guys can use. And that that also helps the uh, and then talking about that in the, some of the keynotes as well. How this you know, the collaboration helps foster innovation and helps innovate innovate faster. It helps us innovate more uh, when we're sharing ideas across all the companies. You know, coming from Come from VMware, coming from VMware, you know, I have one view of the world. Someone coming from Red Hat has a slightly different view of the world. Um, but here we can actually sit together, talk together, figuring out the best way to, to solve these problems that you know, work for all our customers. And that also helps drive standardizations. Because we want to make sure that something that, that works on, on one version of OpenStack works on a different distribution of OpenStack. You know, this was back in the day when we were all doing most of us, a lot of us, were doing Java, trying to deploy Java to different application servers. You know, there's always the problem, it's like you can deploy it here and, or build it here and deploy it everywhere. Um, didn't really work back then, but now we're actually, you know, a few years later down the road, we actually come to a point where all the APIs just in OpenStack are standardized. So if you can deploy it to one, you're very, very likely to be able to deploy it to something else. So just that standardization, getting telcos, you know, out of the, the single vendor um, lock-in and, and making sure that they, they can have, not, not only because they want to put the vend, pitch the vendors against that, just make sure they can push down prices, but also making sure, you know, if someone goes out of business or, or start focusing on something else, you know, they, they, can, they have some options and, and choices and flexibility. Uh, we already talked about it and touched a little bit about the simplified APIs, but they, you know, as they develop their application, as they do their VNFs, they do a lot of testing with these VNFs, um, having the same the same APIs to the underlying platform makes, makes that testing a lot easier because they don't have to write a bunch of different tools to test different APIs. They can basically write, write it once and use it everywhere, right? So, so that makes that a lot easier, cheaper, um, and also, you know, when you don't have to build different skill set and learn different APIs. Hey, here's one API, we can use this for, for everything. And then also, helps you know, the, the, the people that actually develop the, the, the VNFs because they know that there's one, there's one platform that this is going to get deployed on. Might be different vendors, but they all have the same northbound, southbound API. So whatever, whatever network functions I write, if they have any resource needs, I know exactly how to deal with that, whether it's storage or compute or, or networking or secret, ma uh, secret management, whatever it may be. And there's also a, a, a common architecture, and what I mean by that is when you write an application, you might have, that application might have certain uh, expectations in terms of how distributed deployments are done, how HA is done. And having, having OpenStack underneath, with, with the standardized APIs we just talked about, we have the same concept of, of of regions, availability zone, host aggregates, or whatever those various constructs might be. So if you have an application that has some expectations around that, they're gonna be the same across, you know, across all the, the various, various platforms and all the vendors. Another massive uh, benefit is, to, it's, is OpenStack itself, and, and that's why you know, we, we built OpenStack, is to have a standardized APIs that's detached from the underlying drivers. So whether I want to have a VM that gets deployed onto KVM or ESX or Zen or something else, it's the same, it's the same API call basically. So it's, it's hidden from, from, my API, from my VNF developers or my, or my users what, what's actually running underneath and I can you know, plug, plug and play basically the various drivers and, and have a unified experience no matter if I decide to change something in, in the underlying uh, platform. And then that, that gives them, I mean, maybe portability isn't the, the, the best word, but they can deploy and, and move these VNFs between these various platforms and make sure that if it works here, it's gonna work over here, and I don't really need to change anything in my application to make it run on, on a different platform, as long as that platform is OpenStack, whether it runs on a Red Hat stack, whether it's a VMware stack, maybe it's a Rackspace public cloud, it doesn't really matter anymore, right? It's all, it's all OpenStack. 
then there are also a lot of, of the, the workloads that run in these environments that are, there are, very, there are very few workloads that are truly cloud native. Even though there are a lot of talks and sessions about cloud, na cloud native here, there are very few companies, except maybe some, some newer and younger startups, that have everything containerized. Is there anyone in here that runs a deployment environment where everything is containerized, everything is cloud native? Uh, see, may, maybe some, someone may be thinking about raising a hand, but I don't see any hands in the area. Really. I mean, the truth of the matter is that everyone pretty much has something that's either containers or VMs or even bare metal. Uh, and we've been trying to virtualize on the enterprise side for the last 15, 20 years. How many in here still have bare metal running in your data center somewhere? Yes, qu quite, quite a few. And, and the thing when I talk to customers, it feels like it's almost, almost everyone still has something bare metal running. And I think that's a reality that we're going to live with and maybe even see more now when, when uh, we start deploying containers to bare metal and things, and things like that. that we're going to have environments, we're going to have workloads that have parts of it deployed to bare metal, parts of it deployed to VMs, parts of it deployed to containers. How do we get all these workloads talking together? How do we stretch the network between them? And how do we manage and deploy these in, in a single unified way? And that's where OpenStack shines. Right now, if you want to do this outside of OpenStack, you might have one API, one way of doing bare metal. You have one way, one way of deploying VMs and something completely different deploying your containers. Uh, and, and that's one of the things where OpenStack helps as well, where we can have that the same, the same tenancy models, you know, have the same networking. Uh, if you were here listening to Marcus's talk earlier about NSXT, uh, showing how you can share network between VMs and containers, and when you uh, take that a step further and, and have that stretched onto bare metal as well, bare metal as well, and that's something that, that OpenStack can, can help with. Uh, Another thing that's, that's cool with, with OpenStack is that a lot, a lot of uh, the VNFs, even if we're working towards virtualizing the world, a lot of workloads still require uh, direct access to the hardware. It might be because of performance reasons, um, might, might be other reason that it's just more efficient in some way to just talk directly, directly to the hardware. So even in this new virtualized world, we still have workloads that need to talk directly to our, to our NICs. There might be a GPU uh, or, or something similar. So we want to make sure that we still have the capability, even as we're virtualizing, containerizing, we can still get, get that, whether it's streaming or whatever it may be, that they can talk directly to those cards. And then on the other hand, there's a lot of work also going on and have been going on for a while on, on um, enhanced performance on uh, DPDK and enhancing network performance in, in a non-hardware specific way. So we want to make sure that we, we can do both of these and all of these together. So even if we're doing, doing SRV, for example, for, for one workload, we can still share the same environment that, that virtualizes network and get the high performance network with DPDK uh, without having to choose one of the other and have them all, all coexist. And there are, there are some prog projects like Cyborg within, within OpenStack that's looking at how we do, how do we handle this more hardware-centric view of the world in, in, a, in an OpenStack environment and um, making it play nicely alongside all this, this virtualized stuff. That all sounds awesome, right? And, and if all that just worked, um, life would be all good and dandy. But it turns out even moving from your hardware view into to OpenStack, um, there are still, still some challenges. Um, if you've tried, anyone that's tried to deploy OpenStack in production know that there's still, even though we've come a long way, there, there's still some rough corners uh, in there. One, one of the things that is, is still a bit of a challenge and it's, it's both good and bad is that OpenStack has a lot of knobs and, and things to turn and um, configure. So that's, that's good because we can 
cover all use cases. We can do pretty much everything with OpenStack because there are so many things we can change. But that also means that we're building a lot of snowflakes. Um, if, if, you look, if you look at OpenStack and look at the various deployments you have out there, if you have 100 deployments, you might have 100 different deployments. If something goes wrong over here, it's going to be very different from something going on over here. So it's really hard to troubleshoot figuring out what's going on because they're all slightly different. Um, so that, that makes it hard to, to, to very efficiently manage all these various deployments. Even, even within a, a company, you have a large company like, uh, like a telco or a service provider, they might have a fair number of different OpenStack deployments. And if they're all different, you know, the, the configuration management and, and making sure that all the, the drivers are the same, configured the same way, gets really, really hard. Um, and, and even though OpenStack has come a long way from you know, where, we've, where we've been in the last few years, it's not really any better than the, the platform you run on. So OpenStack as a framework, if, if the, the platform it runs on isn't super stable and, and has the resiliency and the high availability we talked about earlier in, in, you know, in the drivers and in the platform underneath, it doesn't matter how good OpenStack is, it's still not going to be able to be better, better than that. Um, we, we talked a little, about, a little bit earlier about global deployments and scale um, and, and OpenStack, though it's getting better and there some projects uh, around this trying to, to address, that, address this, if you have a global presence and, and you want a, an OpenStack deployment that, that spreads across the globe, it's, there's still some challenge in all of that. There's our um, RabbitMQ, that, RabbitMQ that we all know and love still has some challenges. You, know, you start getting into, it all works fine maybe if you're all within the US, it's all deployed within Germany. You start stretching it in, into other, other countries where you might not have the same, same bandwidth, higher latency, you, know, you start running into some, some issues. And, and just the sheer scale of things as well is back to the, uh, the edge use cases you mentioned earlier. Once you get into hundreds or, or even thousands of nodes, it starts to get, to get challenging as well. And, and even, even in smaller deployments, monitoring, monitoring and, and, and uh, operations for OpenStack is, is still hard. The tools have definitely gotten a lot better since I started working on OpenStack, but there's still some challenges in, in doing things like root cause analysis, um, trying to figure out in which, which of my log files do I need to look at, or how does the error that shows up in this log file actually relate to something that's in the log file over here? And, and how do I correlate those and figure out what, what's the actual root cause of this? Uh, and, and that makes it pretty expensive and costly to, to operate these OpenStack clouds because it, it just takes too much time to figure out what, what the issue is. Uh, because every now and then we do hit one of those bugs that, that, that unfortunately is still right. So we need to, need to be, get a lot better at that. How do we, how do you do some more, I mean, even, even better, there's a lot of work going on on you know, AI and predictive, predictive analysis to figure out, how do we figure out where something's gonna crash or which bug are we gonna hit before we even hit it? So we can take some, some measures to prevent that before it even happens. And lastly, if we want to do migrations, if we want to do the import, I know that most workloads today don't, don't run under OpenStack. Now we all want, want, it and want that to happen and we, you know, we're trying to get there. But there's a lot of real estate, a lot of workloads that run on KVM, that run on ESX, that, that run anywhere and we want to get that into OpenStack. Importing those workloads into OpenStack might be tricky depending on what those workloads are. If they're all ephemeral workloads, then yeah, it's, it's not really a big deal. Once you start getting into ed workloads that have advanced networking, they have some persistent, they have dependencies between them, it starts to get a lot harder. We might also want to consolidate uh, data centers or consolidate workloads. And if we have 
25 data centers when they move to two large ones, getting the, the workloads are running one day, all those five data centers into two data centers and, and not having to take a lot of downtime is, is also tricky. We might want to move from a OpenStack version. For some, for some reason, we're not happy with, with the vendor we have now. We want to move to using a different vendor or just we have a really old version of OpenStack. We don't really want to upgrade this because it's running you know, grizzly. And we want to move to Queens. Then doing all those 10 upgrades in between it might be easy to just try and do a migration. But how do, how do we do that without you know, killing all those workloads? So I've been working OpenStack for a while now. Uh, I've been with VMware for a year and a half. Uh, so, so some of those things are, are things we've tried to address and working with some of the, some of, of things, some of you guys in here and some of your colleagues and, and competitors. And how, how do you solve this? And what, what are the, how do you take those? Because it, it all sounds good and the promise of OpenStack is really great, but how do we take that promise and? Uh, overcome those challenges and what, what do we need to, to do to overcome that? So, uh, so we have something called VMware Integrated OpenStack. I don't know how many of you know that VMware actually has an OpenStack distribution. We had that for four years now. Uh, and it's, even though the name might imply that it's something proprietary, I can assure you that it's not. We basically take upstream OpenStack like all the other vendors. We package it up, deploy it on, uh, or install it on Ubuntu, package it up in VMs, deploy it on, on ESX. So we, we have this OpenStack distribution. The, the, the biggest difference between other vendors is that we run on uh, a VM and VMware platform. And that is you know, one, of the, one of the challenges that we've, we've had. A lot, a lot of telcos and vendors already run, run VMware somewhere uh, in, in their, and mine might be on the IT side, maybe not the NFV side, but they, almost all companies today, or a lot of companies today, run something VMware. So extending that environment to also cover OpenStack and get some of the benefit of that virtualization platform that we've been working on for two, for two decades and extending that to get those benefits we talked about earlier and all those things that, that the service provider is looking for, um, but having that stable platform underneath. And that's pretty much what we're saying, that you're saying that you can get the best of both worlds, you can get all that's so good about OpenStack and also get that on that stable platform. So, so that was the, the main driving force behind, behind us as doing OpenStack, because it might confuse some people that, you know, why is VMware doing OpenStack? But it, it's actually a really good fit because we get a lot of requests for, for having those open APIs and the open standards, but having that solid platform underneath. Uh, so some, some of the core things that we've been working on is just like I just said, like the open APIs on that, on that core platform. Being, being virtualized means that We've, we've taken some of the pain away out from, from installing it. That's at least early in the OpenStack di days, upgrading and installing, up, especially installing and upgrading were, were really big pain points in OpenStack. By doing that with, with VMs, we can do some really cool things where we basically, when we do an upgrade, we basically just do, use the same workflow as we do for install and just install new VMs on the same host that, we, that we're already running on. And then the last step in the, inst in the upgrade process, we just sync the databases over to the new VMs, point the load balancer to, to the new VMs, and we're done with the upgrade. Uh, if one of those nasty bugs still happens after we've upgraded, we can just point the load balancer back to the, to the old VMs, and we basically rolled back to the previous version with you know, zero downtime or having to restore machines or bring something else up from tape or whatever it might be. VMware has also worked a lot on, we have a very comprehensive operation suite. And if you have admins that already know VMware, they already manage that IT side of the house, then extending that and having them manage the, uh, the uh, infrastructure that runs uh, the VNFs uh, 
comes, it comes natural, and they can use all the root cost analysis and the, 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 the cost estimation tools that, that we have, uh, and just extend that into the NFV world. And I think we're starting to run a little bit short on time, so I might have to speed it up for the last ones. So we, we, we do it, some of the things we do a little bit different than, than a, a KVM-based OpenStack, for example. Uh, in, in the KVM world, you have one Nova compute, for example, per host. And that means that if you're deploying your Nova compute host at the edge, you get you know, those latencies, latency issues that we've heard and I heard in several sessions here before. We just let things slightly differently where we have a Nova compute mapped to a ESX cluster. So that means that in, instead of having a one-to-one -one mapping, we have a one-to-many mapping, which means that un underneath the cover, OpenStack really just sees an aggregated pool of, of resources, which means that we can use some of the functionality and some of the, the benefits of the, the virtualization platform like, like DRS, for example, and do automatic workload rebalancing underneath the covers. How many here have tried to do workload rebalancing on KVM? No one? A couple of hands? Uh, but in the VM, we, it, it's pretty hard, and, and you know, it's, it's not something that just comes out of the box. But since we aggregate that pool, it's transparent to OpenStack, so we can do, those, do that underneath. If a host goes down, we can fail them over to a different host and do that automatically uh, without crashing OpenStack or, or making Nova get, get really sad and unhappy. We also have something called Vio in the Box, uh, and you know, they, they talked about that in one of the keynotes, so this is some, somewhat similar to what they're doing with, with Starling X as well, where we have, we, we package up OpenStack in a single box, uh, both for a, a branch office use case or maybe a, a uh, opinionated edge use case maybe, if, if you like, where we can deploy OpenStack to a sing, single box and you can take that, ship it as an appliance, ship it as an edge, um, and then we expose all the lifecycle APIs through, uh, we have something called the Oracle, not the Oracle, the, the OpenStack management service. Um, so all the lifecycle management APIs to patch and, and extend the capacity are exposed through, through APIs so you can, if you have an orchestrator or some automated tool, you can use those to manage all those thousands or hundreds of nodes that, that you have deployed uh, across your, your infrastructure. And we have a couple of different modes to deploy that, and we actually have one mode where we, where we have, almost similar to DevStack, we've taken all the OpenStack service and, and put them together into, into a single VM, which makes it really quick and easy to deploy, and you know, very small footprint that you can use for these single block deployments. Uh, and I think lastly, uh, I think we've shown some demos on this. We have something called HCX to store for hybrid cloud connect, which is a, a way where we can extend network fabric between on-prem and, and, and uh, public cloud. And this is something that connects into what we do with, with AWS, the VM, VMware on, on AWS, where we can actually extend the, extend the network fabric from, from your on-prem data data center into the cloud data center. Um, and as we continue to build on this, we'll be able to start doing things like doing live migration from, from an on-prem data center into your cloud. Um, it'll also help us do migrations we can do, basically do a live migration of a VM from uh, one environment to another, which will help us do some of these migration use cases. Uh, and we've also plugged this into some of the the IP we got with an acquisition we did some time back. So we can actually do a warm migration from a KVM-based OpenStack into a VMware-based OpenStack. So I think with that, I have about five seconds left for questions. <laughs> so I'll, I'll stay here for a few more minutes. Uh, I'll be outside afterwards as well when they kick me out if you want to ask me some more questions. Um, so thanks everyone for coming. Have a great rest of your summit.